Welcome back to the control room, still from my kitchen. This is our second episode, and we're so glad you can join us. I'm Jen Cooper, strategy lead for Microsoft's Media and Entertainment. We have a very timely and interesting topic to explore for our second episode. We will be talking about mobile and cloud technology and how that has fundamentally changed the rules of broadcasting. Over the next half hour, we're going to be meeting with industry leaders from Avid and High Vision, who will be talking about the current state of broadcasting and what the future holds. We will also have a very special guest who has a very unique perspective from his many years of broadcasting experience with news and sports. And for our first set of conversations, I'd like to introduce two of our close friends from Avid and High Vision. Coming to us from his control room near Boston, is Ray Thompson, Director hey. of Product Marketing for Avid, and also coming to us over Microsoft Teams from his control room near Montreal is Marcus Scholler, High Vision's Vice President of Product Marketing. Hi, Jen. Thanks. Uh, thanks. It's nice to be here. So let me start out with Ray, if I may. Ray, sure. Avid um, has a long history of working with some of the world's largest names in broadcast. Have you seen the change in the way mobile and cloud technologies have been used by these broadcasters? Yeah, 100%. I mean, um, even before COVID happened, right, we were all experiencing a massive shift, not only in the way in which people consume content, certainly news and sports content, um, but we were seeing a massive shift in the way that people were actually creating content for news um, because everybody was becoming so reliant on social uh, and or accessing content via some type of an app. Um, that meant that broadcasters literally had to change the way in which they were creating news. So they were moving away from a linear broadcast model into a linear plus digital model, which meant I only uh, I not only have to create content for, for that linear broadcast, but now I have to create content that's digital only. They want to drive eyeballs to those digital platforms so they can make money, right? And drive okay. revenue out of this. Uh, out of that content. And, you know, they're either doing it through subscription-based models, ad-sponsored uh, content delivery, um, or even pay-per-view. All really, really great points. Thank you, Ray. So, Marcus, let's um, have you join the conversation. We keep hearing um, about the potential use of IP-based transport through the cloud. Take us through the journey with High Vision and how your um, leadership in this industry has has really helped our broadcasters evolve. Yeah, so um, you know when it comes to IP-based transport, uh, they're, they're normally we we look at it as, as three separate stages. There's the contribution, which is getting live content into the production workflows. Okay, then there's okay. distribution, where the content is sent to wherever it might be needed for, for maybe to OTT data centers, to affiliates, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there's delivery, which is usually what we would use to describe actually getting it to people who are watching it at home. So High Vision plays in all of these spaces, um, but I think the area that's of most relevance uh, to this conversation right now is the contribution and the process of getting content in from the field uh, into those workflows, whether it's a live workflow or an editorial workflow. And um, the components for that, you know, especially if you want to be using the internet, and, and in the day, you know, in the COVID-19 era, internet is critical uh, because it's on demand, scalable, and available everywhere. Uh, you need to be thinking about encoding so that you can actually get streams into the into the internet workflows that are not too big for the amount of bandwidth that's available, especially in times like now where bandwidth is unpredictable. Then you need a protocol to transport it. And that's where SRT comes in. And it stands for Secure Reliable Transport. Uh, and that's exactly what it's all about. It's designed to take those, those uh, encoding streams like H.264 or H2EVC, wrap it in such a way that you can send it low latency into production workflows. And it can either go directly to air or actually if the systems are set up in such a way, it can be then taken directly into editorial workflows. There's a, a, a group called the SRT Alliance, which has been promoting the adoption and um, and, and interop of, of SRT. Uh, that we're a part of, as well as AVID. I to remember, yes. Throwing that in, a little commercial. We're all here together on this. And this is really about ensuring that there are these interoperable workloads where applications from companies like High Vision, like our Makito X or SRT Gateway or SRT Hub, which we'll hear about a little later, uh, and AVID's 
applications can take advantage of this protocol to actually get content in from the field as fast as possible. So, Ray, give us a little more detail how um, Avid works in the SRT context. Yeah, absolutely. So the migration to IP has been happening, uh, as Marcus pointed out, right, even before COVID-19, right, people have been leveraging commodity internet for contribution for a while now. Um, and the SRT protocol uh, encapsulates those files and provides that secure uh, contribution points, right? And so it only made sense as news uh, outlets and sports outlets migrated towards models whereby they wanted to leverage yep. IP, okay. whether that be 4G LTE, 5G coming, um, or standard Wi-Fi or even uh, plugged in internet uh, to basically cover more with less. I mean, think about it. They used to send out a full-on truck with multiple people in a van or a truck who were controllers, and then you had the camera person and the reporter. Now, uh, a reporter could actually go out into the field with just a tablet, right, and have a SRT-enabled app and do all of that work and do all the contribution right from wherever they want to go, um, as long as they have some type of internet connection and they can do contribution uh, into a uh, avid production environment. Marcus, take us through a scenario. Journalists, you know, folks that are doing live production for news, you know, for sports, for reality, right? They're out in the field. And what if there is really poor connectivity? All of these platforms are designed to enable real time conversations, but they're not meant to ensure quality. Um, quality will, you know, in a breaking news situation, it might not be the most important thing. Getting content there fast is important. But over time, your expectation as the story unfolds and, you you know, more and more people are coming in with analysts and commentary and other things, quality suddenly, I mean, it's not suddenly, it's the expectation is there that the quality is going to be good. And SRT is designed specifically to ensure that you have a quality stream coming in even if the internet is unpredictable. So it, it sounds like we're definitely going to be working remotely more. What else? I think uh, I think business continuity first and foremost, right? I think people are going to look at this and say, I need to build out a cloud scenario so that regardless of what happens, I can switch between on-prem and the cloud, right? So hybrid environments will only be incredibly more important. And that, that sync that needs to happen between and on-prem and the cloud is going to be just critical. How do I create that business continuity? And it's the cloud, and everybody knows it. I think everybody kind of knew it beforehand, um, but this experience has just really uh, put a light on the fact that uh, you know we need, really need to do this, and, and it has to happen, and it has to happen sooner rather than later. So I, that's what I would think, yeah. I think what people have learned is that they need to be ready for contingencies, um, and they've put them in place now and they're going to keep them. But now that that transition has happened, you know, there's other ideas like like what AI can bring to the equation and yeah. how that can optimize their, their delivery workflows, how it can be used to ensure that they're spending less money uh, on delivering the content ultimately, which is what they're all, they're all there working on, on doing. Um, and, you know, with a, with a, with a well-trained system of AI that understands how to take video and make it look good, they'll be optimizing their encoder settings, they'll be saving money, they'll be delivering better experiences to their users with less bandwidth, and they're, they're learning how to make this better and better and better. And with that, I'd like to thank you both very much for your time today, for joining Absolutely. us in the control room. And I look forward to speaking with you again very soon, hopefully on similar topics. And yes, we're all getting t-shirts that say, the cloud. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank, Thank you great. very much. Thank you. If you're interested in learning more about the Avid Edit On Demand and its early access program, just go to the link on your screen. It's harder to make mistakes and easier to get your work done. It is indeed uh, safe to put your billion dollar movies into Azure. We believe in art culture, in the power of creativity. For us, this business is more than a business. Our fantasies, our realities, our most important moments are made by you. We believe in our artists, in our future artists, in the future of our industry, in the future of media. We believe innovation drives evolution, that access drives inspiration. 
that your life's work is the thing that colors our perceptions and changes our world. We believe that your work moves us all forward, so we work to keep you moving. At Avid, we make many products, but we only do one thing. Maximize the mediums of amazing makers. Every minute of every day, we are powering greater creators. And welcome back to The Control Room. I'm Jen Cooper. We're going to spend the next few minutes diving into some of the technical aspects associated with what the future of broadcasting really looks like. For this, we'd like to hand over to Joel Sloss, the security lead for Microsoft's media and entertainment team. We also would love to thank Ray for staying on a little bit longer, and we would love to welcome our new guest, Dan Epstein, product manager from High Vision, to the control room. And so now over to you, Joel. All right, thanks a lot, Jen, uh, and thanks to uh, Ray and Dan for joining us and uh, and staying on. So, Dan, I've uh, I've heard you talk a little bit about SRT Hub. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and what it does? For sure. On the contribution side, particularly, we've really worked to make it as as simple as possible to get stood up. So, with with the SRT protocol, which of course is open source, we can take any. SRT capable encoder or a mobile device that has an application supporting SRT like our Play Pro app. Um, there are a number of other apps in market that also can send streams and be able to within minutes get a, a URL out to a correspondent in the field to be able to con contribute over a mobile device with a broadcast quality stream back into master control. Uh, Dan, can you take us through a little bit of acquisition and contribution in this diagram? Sure. So on the on the left hand side, when you've got a case where you have a correspondent in the field without any gear, we can take mobile contribution as SRT directly from a phone or or a tablet, and we can take the the pretty high quality encoding that we've got in our pockets today and and the very good cameras, apply SRT to it and bring it as a broadcast native codec and and uh, transport protocol into the broadcast workflow and have that live right alongside uh, the uh, traditional hardware encoders that might be on a truck or at a remote facility. Again, using that same packaging, that same uh, or higher quality and definitely lower latency than a, than a personal device. But we can bring those both in and have those live side by side in the production workflow. So let's talk a, uh, a minute about infrastructure. So up on the screen, we have a visual that goes through the various components uh, of the end-to-end -end workflow. So Ray, can you uh, walk us through some of the uh, initial steps there? Yeah, sure. So when you think about acquisition and sort of what we're talking about, you're talking about Makitos out in the field, um, again, enabling a reporter to be pretty much by themselves, covering a story wherever they may be with access to uh, an internet connection of some kind, being able to then leverage the SRT protocol to encapsulate that file or stream and send it over, come out of the internet and deliver it into the cloud, right? And this, again, provides an enormous amount of flexibility allows media companies to provide more coverage uh, with less, right? It's really just an incredible tool set. And then once that content makes it into the cloud, we're actually ingesting that using Fast Service Stream. Fast Service Stream was launched as a, a tech preview back at IBC in the fall, and we've done a significant amount of work to it since then. And uh, you'll hear more about Fast Service Stream in the future, but essentially it's allowing an agnostic ingest of incoming IP streams, which then puts it into an Avid-friendly format, checks it into the Nexus file system, which means now it's available to anybody in the cloud who's using either Media Central or Media Composer, or for that matter, even third-party tool sets. Ray, when you think about this from a, uh, from a delivery perspective, can you walk us through some of those aspects? So in terms of delivery, it really starts with uh, being able to provision resources into the cloud. And again, we've uh, we've done a lot of work to do a lot of auto provisioning. Of course, this is uh, work that's been done to sort of put the Nexus file system on top of uh, Azure storage, but it's also all the compute. And then in some cases that compute requires a GPU. 
And so we need GPU enabled VMs in order to run Media Composer, for example. Well, at the same time, we're also running sort of Media Central on different VMs, right? Um, so we're really working with the customer. We're doing a lot of that work for them in the background. And then once they're uh, stood up, it's uh, then just enabling people to access content from the cloud. So let's uh, shift gears for a bit and talk about uh, my favorite subject, uh, security. Dan, can you uh, give us a sense of how SRT provides a secure method for uh, distributing content? Sure, Joel. So, of course, we developed the SRT protocol in, from the outset with AES-128 and 256-bit point-to-point encryption between all nodes. We continue to expand that uh, with feature sets coming from the SRT Alliance community, things like secure key exchange, authentication and authorization workflows, and you know things like you know, stream ID, DTLS, potentially uh, authorization tokens. We, we continue to expand that within the protocol. And then within our cloud service, SRT Hub, we've built it from the ground up as a cloud native application with security at the uh, at the outset. So Ray, from a, a collaboration perspective, uh, can you share with us how solutions like uh, Media Composer ensure protection against some of, uh, you know, some of these risks? Absolutely. So uh, if you think about on-prem deployed systems today, um, a lot of these systems and networks are not exposed to the internet for the very fear that um, they might get some type of malware or that someone might actually hack into their system and steal that content. And so uh, we have definitely done quite a bit of work, obviously with Microsoft, and leveraging a lot of the security that's already baked into the Azure platform uh, to sort of uh, help convince some of the biggest media companies in the world that it is indeed uh, safe to put your billion dollar movies, for example, into Azure. And uh, that has happened. Are there technical resources you'd suggest that uh, the people uh, interested in learning more about this should go and uh, seek out? Well, well, definitely on the on the SRT side, we have the srtalliance.org website, which has detailed information about implementing and using the open source protocol SRT. And we also have our SDK for developing hublets directly within the SRT hub platform. And then we also have a page on avid.com that describes a lot of what we're talking about here, uh, which is the Avid and Microsoft page, which lists really uh, everything that we've been working on pretty much since the start of the relationship, which, by the way, we just announced has been extended for yet another, I think, five years. So we're also very excited about that. I uh, really appreciate the time that you uh, took out of your busy schedules to join us here today and, uh, and dive into these details. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Joel. We really appreciate it. Get two months free when you sign up for the SRT Hub annual subscription and mention the control room. Just visit the link on your screen for more details. Offer good until June 30th, 2020. It allows all of your people to be reporters for your organization. What is SRT? SRT stands for Secure Reliable Transport and is a protocol for streaming pristine quality live video over the internet. As a low latency point-to-point -point streaming protocol, SRT is ideal for first mile applications such as video contribution, backhaul, bi-directional interviews, and broadcast return feeds. When sending live video from one location to another, satellite and fiber are not always viable options due to cost and deployment time. The internet, however, is ubiquitous and cost-effective, but as an unmanaged network, it can be unpredictable. SRT delivers great-looking video over the internet by combining low-latency UDP streaming with ARC packet loss recovery. Let's take a look at how SRT works. To recover lost packets and prevent jitter, the SRT protocol includes a latency buffer on both the sender and receiver side. The SRT receiver buffer reconstructs the sender's stream packets and sequences before passing them on to a decoder. If a packet gets lost along the way, a negative acknowledgement or NAC is sent back to the sender. The sender then resends the packet from its buffer back to the receiver. The SRT latency buffer can be configured as a multiple of RTT depending on network conditions and distance to allow for packet retransmission. SRT can stream any type of content including H.264 and HEVC video. The SRT protocol includes AES-128 and 256-bit encryption to ensure the secure delivery of high-value content. When sharing streams between networks, SRT includes caller and listener modes for establishing secure bi-directional data flows from behind a firewall. 
SRT has been widely adopted by over 250 technology vendors and it continues to evolve as the industry standard for video streaming. Best of all, SRT is open source and can be downloaded on GitHub. If you are interested in high vision solutions that support SRT, then please get in touch. And welcome back to the control room. We've had the chance today to hear from our friends at Avid and High Vision, speaking to industry trends and some of the latest solutions empowering broadcasters through the power of the cloud. Now, we are very excited to spend some time with a veteran of the industry, Bill Kazarba, president of Esperance Media. Bill's experience hails from broadcasters that include CNN and Fox Sports. He has real world experience on how broadcasters have approached technologies, mobility, and the cloud. Bill, welcome. Delighted to have you in the control room. Good to be here. Thank you. From your awesome set of experiences, how are you seeing the change in broadcasting with the COVID crisis? It, it's almost like back to the future. I, I remember I was one of those people starting um, one of the very early digital uh, news production environments for Yahoo. In fact, um, when there was the war in Iraq, um, we partnered with ABC News and they had a mobile phone, an actual camera on a rooftop taking mobile uh, phone pictures of the war. And that was what we were streaming. And, and today, when we're all working from home and when journalists are gathering news, how do you think the 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 control room and actually the newsroom has evolved from you know from the times that you know you were in the in the newsroom and and my little experience um, you know with phone capture and now how technology is bringing it all together via the cloud. I was the control room producer at CNN when we brought those first pictures in. We had a thing called a four wire which was about as primitive as you get, but it left lines of communication open. So we could talk to the reporters and the producers and all the camera people that were in Baghdad. But now you take what's being done and that's an everyday occurrence. You see the ability to go live with a tablet, uh, the ability to go live with a smartphone, the ability to edit in the field and be able to draw video from a common source is incredibly helpful in terms of speeding up the process. And what it does, in my opinion, is it makes your people the competitive differential. But it also means that if you don't keep up with the technology, you will fall behind very quickly. You know, um, if you and I were to look into the future, um, looking at the way that we now work, how do you think the world post-COVID is going to change the world of broadcast for news, for live events? Well, you know what it allows to, uh, you know, places to do is it allows people to cover more things because you don't need the camera and the equipment and the live truck and the satellite truck. It allows all of your people to be reporters for your organization. It allows you to take in viewer video and viewer comments and eyewitness reports. Now, with new technology and the ability to deliver it and with broadcast quality streams and instantaneous go to air, I think that now television and particularly journalism can be better than it's ever been before. The future of broadcast is not only incredibly bright, but it is also going to help all of us redefine how we interact with those moments? I believe broadcasters can truly engage with their audience now in a much easier way. Yeah. You know, one of the things in the old days at CNN, we considered our advantage that we were willing to use a phone. So while apartheid was going on, uh, our competitors at the broadcast networks would be talking to a person from Georgetown University that came in their studio in Washington and was able to talk about what was going on. But because we were willing to use the phone, we were able to talk to Nelson Mandela, right? And I just think it's an incredible time because we can reach anybody on earth now. You're, you're so right about that. And clearly this is such a, a topic of passion for both of us. 
But unfortunately, um, you know, our episode has come to an end and I am deeply grateful. Thank you so much for being here with us in the control room and sharing um, the, these really great insights with us, Bill. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to. Thank you. If you'd like to see if you're eligible for a free six month Office 365 E1 trial, including Microsoft Teams, just visit the website on your screen. So this brings us to the close of our second episode in the control room. I can't thank you all enough for being with us. And I must thank our friends from Avid, High Vision, and a special thank you to Bill Kazarba and his wonderful Emmys. All the content is available on demand on our website. And next week, we will be covering another riveting topic, trends dealing with content delivery and distribution. And now, Signing off for today from the control room, I'm Jen Cooper.